Refreshments as frequently as you'd like. Uh, <laughs> why not. Um, okay, so I'll introduce myself. Everyone knows who I am, but I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dave Morgan. Okay. I work for Marco at University of Rochester. I'm also a graduate student, technically still. So, <laughs> so uh, someday, my uh, supervisors are Dan and Steve. Um, and I finally got around to defending them. Okay. So, um, Here's Dave, super quick. So how this is going to work, because I know there's a couple of grad students who haven't done this yet, is um, how this usually runs is Dave will go through his defense. He will defend, um, talk about his project, and then a QA. and a And do you mind, Dave? I always ask you if we ask if we have questions we ask through, or you want us to save them to the end? Um, I will. There, there's some stuff I might address later. If it's addressable, I'll just say that's coming up. Otherwise, good it's going to be okay. at the end. That's not good. I don't um, have any <coughs> Yeah. So we'll, we'll go through doing that. Um, at the end, we'll have a question and answer for everybody. Um, and after that, and everybody's satisfied, um, we have the joy of kicking you all out of the room while Steve and I actually talk and discuss Dave's future <laughs> and, 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 and lack of donuts. Um, and, 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 and then we'll, we'll, we'll call back Dave back in the room and we will give him the good news. So, you are on the So, uh, all right. So, you are HL7. Uh, this is this is what I'm defending, all right. Uh, and basically, the summary version is: it's an open source HL7 parser. Okay. Uh, most people don't even know what that is, but um, the HL7 is a medical format. I'm going to show an example in a second. Um, but it's not normal. Okay. So most of us, when we talk about a format or, or something like that, we're, we're thinking nowadays more in the XML kind of. World, you know, so something's an XML format, you can parse with an XML parser, and everybody's happy, and it comes standard with languages, and things are good. Uh, HL7 comes back from a time when it was more of a delimited format, you know, more binary kind of thing, uh, and a parser just doesn't come out of the box with Java, okay, or any language for HL7. Um, there are parsers available. We had one at uh, the RNC and uh, in our engine. I'll talk about that in a second, um, but we. I didn't think it was very good, and I said, Marco, hey, this sucks. And Marco said, yes. And then I said, Marco, can I waste my time? I mean, no, uh, put it. significant effort towards a project that will help us. Marco said, OK. So I started building this. Um, HL7 was created in 1989. Okay, it's been around for a while. It's been a lot of revisions. Each revision, in theory, is backwards compatible. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, fuzziness to that. But for, in general, uh, PID 5, which is patient identifier segment, field 5, has always been and will always be patient name. Okay. Um, uh, I'm specifically talking about version 2 HL7. There is. Come on in, Kevin. It's not bad that you're late at all. <laughs> okay. So version 2 uh, is the format that's pretty much standard everywhere. Okay, there is a version 3. Version 3 is based in XML. Um, but it's not really used. Uh, it, it is essentially a translation of hit 5 which is what you would call patient name area here, to a tag that says patient name. Uh, the problem is, is XML is much more verbose than uh, uh, standard version 2 HL7. So you're actually just increasing the size of your message, but you're not getting a whole lot of bang for your buck with that. Version 3 also gets confused with the CCD or the CDA document which is a whole other thing, but um, a very short version of that is that's your entire, entire patient history, essentially, in that one document. Um, this is more of a transactional kind of message. 
So this is what an HL7 message looks like. I've truncated some of the data towards the end because each, each segment, so let's get some of the terminology here, each segment is a new line, okay, separated by character term. In this particular message, each field is broken up by the pipe character, and the fields can be broken up again by the caret. Okay? They can be broken up again by an ampersand. So there's also a very interesting kind of gotcha that if you have a repeating field, okay, the concept of maybe you have more than one MRN, uh, that is broken up by a tilde. Okay? That is all based on the first five characters after the MSH in the message. MSH stands for message header. The next character is the field delimiter. The next character is the, the component delimiter. The next one is the repeating. The next one is the escape character. And the next one is the subcomponent delimiter. Okay. Uh, it's kind of strange, but it actually works out pretty well. And it's actually very easy to parse once you get your head around it. Uh, but this is a sample message. I'm going to just kind of reference this message. It is just an order. Okay. There's nothing particularly special about it. OK. The big reason that, we, that I built your HL7 is that we wanted to be able to access specific data points easily. Okay. Um, in our current part, I'll say current, in the previous parser that we used to use at your RMC, um, to do that, it felt a lot like uh, a Jax B kind of methodology. You would have Java beans that got built for every component in the message. So a segment, and then a field, and then a component. And then you'd have to end up chaining get this, get this, get this, get this. Each time you called a get, if any of those were null, you get a null pointer exception. So you'd have to test all of that. So now your code, all you want to get is the order. And if there's not an order ID there, you just want to say there's not an order ID there. You don't want to have a, a big headache. But every time you would call one of these gets, you would have to make sure that it was there before you got it. So you got more and more code to do something relatively trivial as far as conceptions. Okay? So the big thing here is, I want the order ID, right? So it's in the ORC segment. Okay, I'll jump back up real quick. Okay, there's multiple segments. One of them is the ORC. What's the ORC sample? Uh, common order. It's just a uh, thing. Yeah. And the order ID is actually in a couple different segments, but this is just a good place to grab it. It's a new order, uh, and the order ID is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's really test data, not actual. Okay. When we're talking as interface analysts, we would just say, I want ORC2, ORC2.1. Okay. Um, that's just kind of the lingo that we use. And what we're able to do with your HL7 is we can actually just pass in a string literal, ORC, which is the segment name, 2, which is the field, and 1, which is the first uh, part of that field. Okay. What's interesting is the lingo does not match necessarily what the underlying data structures would be. For example, a programmer's in the room are thinking 0, 1, 0 base index, uh, or even more confused, 0, 1, 2, but this isn't really 0. So the, the lingo doesn't necessarily match up with the actual underlying data structure. But we pass in a string literal, we get back, well, we, we call get data on that, which will turn it into a string, which handles all the escape characters that we have to worry about. And then we have the order ID as a string. If that's not there or something's not right, intentionally by design, we will just get back an empty string. Not a null. The idea was to avoid exceptions. It's a little bit easier to handle. Oh, it's just an empty string. We can just kind of test those things. Uh, but that's where that came from. Dave, if you if you did this, but you did ORC-2, mm -hmm. what would you get? You would actually get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, caret, okay. EPC. Yeah, and then you can parse it later if you Right, all right. So you can kind of yeah. go as abstract up as you want. Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about interesting things with that. Okay. Not every time, it's not every time that you want to actually just grab a single field. Sometimes you want to grab multiple. Okay. So I'll give you a couple examples here. Um, what I'm doing here, okay, before Steve yells at me for magic numbers and stuff, um, I know that I want to grab the MRNs for this patient. Okay, have two MRNs. Uh, in our situation at Strong, uh, we have an Epic MRN, which is our new uh, EMR. And then we have the Flowcast MRN, which is our old ADT system. Both are associated with the patient. Uh, in this particular example, I'm just talking about numbers. I don't really care about 
the actual sources. What I can do is I can I can use Fury Excel 7 to get all of the PID 3.1s. Okay. Head segment, it's got it. One, two, three, which is this field. Okay. And the dot ones, which are located here and highlighted. Okay. There's multiple of them because we have a repeating segment here. Okay. If I were to ask for just the get, which would be the first occurrence, it would give me the E11333 value. Uh, but since I want all, I'm going to get both the E number and the 7 number. And then that's just stored in a simple list. The array list is the underlying data type. And then I can just do whatever I wanted with those. In this case, I'm just grabbing each one so we have them as strings. Okay. Again, calling it data to escape or unescape if there was any escape here. Because you have to deal with those. <clears throat> now let's talk about some of those more complex things. Okay. In this situation, I have uh, the same kind of problem. I want to grab the medical record number. Uh, in this particular case, I'm just going to grab the first one. But let's say I want to get the data related to each other. Okay. So what I'm doing here is actually, I kind of refer to it as the hard way. Okay. The, the helper is really easy. That's what we were doing before. You can just grab a specific data point. If you want to start getting related data, you kind of need to keep a reference to where you are. You can simply access the underlying data objects, which are essentially lists of lists of lists. And you can say, all right, I want to access my structure and get the PID segments. Okay? There's ever only one, but I can get them. I can select the first one. And then you can get the repeating field three, which will give you the lightly shaded uh, data here with the carrots. With the carrots okay? Now, since this is actually an HL7 repeating field rather than a data field, you're actually able to use the underlying data structures which now you can just say, get me field zero, which is the first instance. OK, and I'll give you the first MRN. Um, sorry, this will get you back up a little bit. Uh, field zero will give you this, this highlighted part, OK? Because there's two there, so zero and one. Okay. When I ask for field zero, I get this section. And then I can ask for specific components, zero and four. Those are back to your normal zero index stuff. MRN value and the MRN type. So I'm able to store E111333 to the MRN value, the EPI to the MRN type. What other data? So how, how complex does this get? I mean, what if you have five carrots in there? You just have to know that it, the field component will go to five? Yeah. So okay. you can you can do your standard test to say how long is this, how long is this list? Because they're all yeah. lists. Okay. Um a lot of the, the, the big thing is if you if you're working with HL7, you usually have a spec, and you know what you're supposed to be getting. Okay? Um, when you're using the helper, it is very uh, error friendly. Okay? The, the, the general idea was Marco wanted to load the database table. Okay? And he knows he's going to get a bunch of messages, and he knows all the messages should have a first name, a last name, an MRN, a visit number, all these things. And it doesn't matter really if it's an ADT or a lab, they're all going to be kind of in the same place. Let me just grab them. If any of them are empty, OK, I'll worry about that later. But just let me get at the data, and then I'll load my data. Okay? So for the helper, it's very easy to just grab whatever data you need to grab. When you're talking about the underlying data structures, now you have to be a little bit more cognizant of the fact that you are using lists. Okay? So you can get index out of bounds if you ask for uh, component 18, and it's not there. But knowing the spec, so in this case, MRN is the first part of that. And then four over, you've got your type. You can just ask for those. Okay. You can test if they're there. Too. The four in between are just placeholders for data that you don't yes. have. Okay. Yes. And they're always going to be six of them there. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yep. All right. so, so you don't have problems of, well, just get rid of all the carrots because I don't know where the last one is. Well, you can have So the spec says this is what's supposed to happen. Uh, different systems sometimes say different things. And if that's the case, you, you just have, I mean, Part of the analysis and the testing is, okay, what is the system actually telling us? And then you can handle that accordingly. All right. So they, these data types, HL7 repeating field and HL7 mm -hmm. field are actually lists? No, these are, these are essentially, under the hood, we're talking wrappers for strings that basically have um, a bunch of handle functions, like get, get value, uh, sorry, get data set data, all that kind of stuff. 
when you ask for get segments, that's going to return to you a list. When you say get repeating field, that gives you a specific one. You can say get repeating field to give you the list back. Okay. Uh, same kind of thing. So you always have the option to grab the list of its children, because that thing kind of has children, um, or you can just grab a specific one if you know where you're going. What's the data type that get segments returns? Get segments? Will is return it, is it a custom data type, or is it? It is it, under the hood. It is an array list. Right. It shows it up as a list of HL7 segments. Um, which kind of gets us back to the discussion about the data field. Okay, so I'll jump really quick back here. I'm using data field as a generic kind of thing over here. Over here, I'm using the underlying data types. Field, component, subcomponent are all data fields. Okay. Because they all can actually have atomic data in them. Okay. Data field uh, has is it, it's an interface, it's a get data and a set data. Okay, except and, and spit out. The key thing is each field, the underlying data type, will, will handle the escape characters that you need them to handle. Okay. Um, and that's based off of the structure, because every every object knows its structure and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, if you wanted to just get the pure data, so if you just wanted to see all the carrots and you wanted to see all of that kind of stuff, you can use marshal and unmarshal. That will marshal it out as the actual data that should go across the wire, or unmarshal it into the underlying structure. Every object has the ability to do that. So, touched on this a little bit, but talking about it again. The helper, the helper object, okay. Now, here's the, you know, get to have an argument of whether or not it's a good pattern. Uh, it, we have the structure, okay, which is an HL7 structure. That's the actual argument you take. Uh, and then there is a singleton method I call helper. Okay. The reason why it's a singleton method is because inside the helper, there's a cache. Okay. So the idea here is that you want to be able to access the data, and if you want to access, access it a lot, and you're just doing a lot of gets, essentially, you don't want to have to traverse the entire structure over and over and over and over and over. So, uh, if you create just a structure, you can use the underlying data types, and you can do whatever the heck you want, and you're good. You don't have to spend that time, which is not really a significant amount of time, but any time, I'm building the cache. Once you instantiate the helper, um, you get the cache, and speeds for a single call are about the same, but this, if you start calling more things, you actually get more speed on there. Um, but once you do that, uh, you also incur a slight cost that if you make any modifications, the next call you call to anything that includes the helper, it will rebuild the cache. Because if you make a modification, I don't necessarily know if you made just a simple modification to one field, or if you changed an entire language structure. Um, but uh, this terser thing, where we just take a literal string, is actually pretty handy. Okay, or see, that's the segment name. Two is the field position. Um, in, in the segment, it actually ends up being the index as well. And then you have the component position, which is not the index. It's a one-based, well, it's still index, but one-based index. Um, if you call get, it'll get you the first instance. Um, we want to be able to do a little bit more than just grab the first instance of something that you ran into. First, this comes out here. Uh, you can grab specific indexes of any of the segments or any of the fields that might exist. This is how you're going to be able to handle OBX segments. OBX is an observation segment. So you go to the lab, they draw your blood, you pass out for whatever reason. You break your face. You break your face. <laughs> you then, <laughs> it's a reference. Uh, so it happened to me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so that, but then they, they do, you know, a platelet count, they do a glucose, they do all the things that they're going to do to go to the lab and they're going to pay the money to do it. So they'll, they will all come back in the HL7 message. They don't, they don't each need their own HL7 message. You can tie a lot of them together. Okay, it was a simple order, and then you've got observation, 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 observation. You can get a bunch of those. Let's say you want the first one. You can just pass that in. Let's say you want the first instance of field two. Pass that in. And, and, and those are the only things that have the, the, the repeating ability, so those are the ones that you can actually specify those indexes in the actual terser. But you have that ability in the string literal. So the data type in that would actually literally have more than one ORC row. Yeah, so let's, let me jump really quick back here. Um, 
Or she's a bad uh, example. I should have done more. Oh, OBX. OBX. Okay. OBX. You have two OBX segments. Okay. Now, looking at it, you have a one and a two. Yeah. But in the structure, it's really just two segments. Okay. And sometimes the, the system might not give you back a number here. Yeah. But let's say you want uh, U-type or something like that, um, and you want it only from this one. You can specify this index, and then if this were repeating similar to how like MRN repeats, you can specify this index of it. Totally for my edification, but do you have do you have any knowledge in that data structure that OBX two, the second one, is actually later than OBX one? Is it added in a linear way? So it's not a tree structure; it's still a list structure. So yeah. I do know, but um, one of the nice things, and actually something that we're working on, hopefully figuring out, uh, because one of the pain of, one of the big pain but is that related thing. So you want this field and this field in the same segment. I want them related. I want them back related yeah. rather than doing like a troll. Um, we're working on a syntax in that, that tercer to be able to do that because since everything happens in order, when we parse it all in, we happen in order, we can actually, I say we, me, um, I just want to sound like I'm important. <laughs> uh, you can actually look through and you can say, okay, this is related to this because in HL7, everything kind of happens top down, right? So you've got a patient and you've got a visit and you've got an order, and that order has observations. If you get another uh, OBR, or result, sorry, result, then you get more OBXs after that. Another result, you get more OBXs after that. So it, it's kind of, it, it is kind of like a tree. It's not officially stated as a tree, but you're able to infer relationships. Yeah, there's data the structure then. Yes, yeah. All right. So you can grab different pieces of it. Um, touched on this a little bit. What happens if there's nothing there, or you screw, you ask for ZZZ and it's not in there? Um, what will return from the helper is a null field. Right. Null field is just a dumb little object. It has a string on it that's an empty <laughs> string that has a bit in the set that is not attached to anything, but will prevent any null pointers from occurring. Okay, so you don't get null pointers. And if you want to set to it, you can set to it and then pull data back out of it. So if you're doing something where you're doing just kind of like a transitional thing, and you're saying, okay, we'll store it here and then pull it back out here, you'll still be able to get that data and that flow will still work. But this, this null field is never attached to the message itself. Okay. Um, and again, in conscious design decision, yes, it might, it might hide some errors that you might be putting into your code by accident, but it was a conscious design decision to avoid throwing exceptions um, and throwing uh, in, in our world, the exceptions could cause bad things to happen. So it's okay to disappear and sleep them under the rug. Uh, and you might not want to be quite as heavy handed as a track action in a particular situation. But, uh, um, that, that helper object, the whole point is to give you an easier way to access all of these underlying data objects. Okay. Um, <coughs> each uh, data object usually contains a list, okay, subcomponent doesn't because there's nothing that subcomponent can have as a child. Um, and the bottom three are all base fields. They can they implement data field, and the top three do not. They never have atomic data themselves. Um, this is what I just said, okay. Uh, the repeating field is the strangest one, okay. Um, <clears throat> if you were to read the HL7 spec, uh, they would say, oh, well, the repeating field is just a special kind of field, kind of thing, the way that they structure it. The way that they describe it in the spec is very confusing. Um, the way that it's handled in your HL7 is you have structure, which has segments, which has repeating fields, which has fields, and so on. Um, what that, that gives you an interesting problem, which is most repeating fields have a cardinality of one. They have one field in them, and that's all it is. Uh, so a lot of times if you're doing some actual data structure manipulation, you're, you get the repeating field and you have to say, just get me the zero. It's always going to have a field, but give me, the, give me the first index. And that's a problem, but at the same time it saves you a headache later when you're trying to figure out how do I handle 15 MRNs that are all trapped together. Um, so uh, just to show some code and to prove that it works, uh, I'm going to show. Um, the, the 
access example. Okay. Um, so this is where your HL7 is very helpful. One of the big deficiencies that we had with our previous parser was um, you had to build the structure. You had to specify a lot of the underlying structure in the parser itself. And if it didn't match that, it never unmarshaled, and you were going to have a bad day. What I've got here is two ADT messages. Okay? One of them is from our Highland ADT system. Okay? This is a test message, and this is also a test message. Uh, <laughs> so HBLC is an ADT message from Highland. Flowcast is an ADT message from Strong. Okay, they're, they're, they're actually pretty different. Now what I had said about at the beginning when I was talking about the message where usually it's a pipe and then a carrot and a, you know, a slash. Clearly this isn't that. Okay? But this is still a valid HL7 message. Okay? Uh, the first characters after the MSH define the message, the, the characters are easy. A double slash for that is getting out. So zoom in. Um, but we've got this kind of message. But if you look at PID, you've still got a PID 3, which is 773145, and a PID 5, which is Audrey ICD 9, this location name. Okay. And then we go down here, and we've got the same kind of thing. We've got a PID 3. A little bit more complicated PID 3, but that's okay. And then a PID 5. Okay. So, what I'm going to do just as a demonstration. I'm not going to type it because that takes forever, but we'll talk about it. All I'm going to do really quick is create two HL7 structures. Okay? Uh, it's Kevin Burley's fault that I call it Igor. Yeah, it's well, it's Igor. Right? So, <laughs> oh, it's totally <laughs> cool. awesome. <laughs> so, the big idea here is there's, there's, a, there's a construction class called Igor that basically, if you need to create arbitrary objects of any type, you can just access these methods and it'll, it'll do it. Um, your structure will create you a structure based on the data that you pass in. You can specify the delimiters, you can specify nothing, or whatever you want to do. It'll give you either the basic, most basic HL7 message you can do, or it'll give you um, what the data is in all the structures. Uh, you can, you can uh, create a HL7 structure from a constructor, but it's a little bit more of a nightmare. So the Igor is just a helper. Everything's in one place. You can just say stuff. So, HBOC, Flowcast. Okay, they're two different structures. I could do two different things to them. Or I could be lazy and put them into a list, and then we'll just do it all as, as, a, as a loop, which is what we're going to go for here for demonstration purposes. So, both messages, really simple, have a PID5.2, which is your patient first name, PID5.1, which is the patient last name. Therefore, give a name and family name if you want to be correct. Uh, I'm just going to print those out. I grab them, print them out. And then I just want to grab all the PID3.1s. And I'm just going to grab the MRNs. So I'm just going to see a bunch of MRNs. And then I'm going to demonstrate the same kind of thing that we did, that I did in the slides. I'm going to grab the PID segment. I'm going to grab the B field. It goes off here. It's the same thing as in the slide. Get the fields. So I'm going to then get the MRN and the type. So unfortunately, there's no really good way to make the result pane bigger. But um, I can read for everybody that can't see, except for me. Okay? So it's running. Runs in the patient Audrey ICD-9. The MRNs are 773145. Okay? MRN and context was that and HBOC. That patient was good. Next patient. Alice, ED, OB, one whatever. Uh, they run 8251. 8012949. Okay. And that was an epic and a strong MRN. Okay. You can access data very quickly, very easily. Which makes everybody that is sitting in that row right there mm -hmm. very happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there you go. That's fun. Yay. Now what I want to do is demonstrate some of the modification capabilities. Very high level. Um, same messages, same deal, doing a loop again. Okay. I'm going to change the MSH segment. Okay, so MSH 384, that's the source system and source facility. I'm just going to switch it to Dave Morgan because why not? Um, 
And all I have to do is say, give me MSH3, give me MSH4. Uh, MSH doesn't follow the same numbering conventions as far as lingo goes that all the other segments do. They're so weird, but we handle it. Uh, set those data points, which is great. And then what I want to do is, tell you what, let's grab uh, just the first, for argument's sake, just the first PID 3.1. And then we're just going to pad it with zeros. Okay, this is a common thing that we have to do if some systems want a specific length MRN or whatever they want to do. So I'll just pad it to zero with zeros. And then I'm just going to set the data back in. Okay. Real simple modification to the data. Not a big deal. I run it. Okay, again, unfortunately, really small. But I assure you, that says Dave, that says Morgan, that says Dave, that says Morgan. And then if we look at the MRN right here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 7, 7, 3, 1, 4, 5. And over here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, change the structure itself. Uh, I shouldn't have said that because I don't really want to do it, but I'll do it in a little bit if you like. <laughs> hey, Dave, in, in practice, where is this data coming from? Is it streams to you? Is it in a file? Two places. Um, most common, and what we usually talk about, comes via SI. Okay, so uh, in most situations, you have, let's say, a mission system, and then you have a lab system. The mission system sends an ADT message, like one of these, goes to the interface engine. Um, in our situation at URMC, comes in on socket, puts, gets put onto a queue, which then gets read by a service that we write, and essentially it's passed to us as a parameter. As um, in our situation, it's, it's actually still the underlying parser that we use at URMC, which is an OTD, CB on OTD. Um, there's some other Jacks kind of them, but it's just an object. It's, it's an object or is it a big string? Well, okay, so it's a big string, yeah. but it's as an object at that point. Okay, so it, 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 is, it is a string, we will always think of it as a string, but it is an object we get in that time. Um, added on to that layer complexity is our HL7 message actually gets wrapped in an XML file as we send it, because then we can put metadata across and we can share that metadata across services because we pass it through multiple services that we don't want. Um, so in reality, we get an XML, the HL7 message gets put into an XML file, gets put onto a queue, gets read off the queue into a service, we pull the HL7 message out of the XML file, okay? Um, and then one of two things happens. Either we use the CBeyond OTD HL7 parser thing, which we can do, or we will use your HL7. We use our, your HL7, we say get payload from our XML, and we just pass it to the Igor constructor, and oh, sorry, the Igor factory method, and got it. Um, that will, modifications will happen. So, you know, everyone does different modifications. Uh, Fred does lab stuff, so he'll probably do a lot of stuff based on breaking up orders or, or whatever he needs to do. Kevin does transcription. We have an RTF thing that happens. So whatever processes we need to do, go on. wrap it back up in the XML, send it off to our outbound service that we built, which puts it on a sign and sends it to the next system. Right, so you do one message at a time. Yes. Now, <laughs> so that's the one way that we do it. Okay. The second way is Marco's way. <laughs> we'll call it that. Okay. <laughs> so, so Marco's got a big X database, <laughs> which is great. His databases are awesome. Um, and so what happens is, every now and then, we have a problem where we just want to turn off a main frame. And to do that, we need to basically get an extract out of the main frame, which comes out as a flat file. The flat file is going to be an HL7 message, as you see it there, um, with a couple extra bits here and there, okay? Real quick version, rather than carriage returns at the end of the message, it's carriage return one. Okay? Those are all put together. Okay. What's coming up next is how do we get to do a batch file like that? Okay, we're still going to process it one message at a time, but you can do it in kind of a bulk load kind of fashion. So, uh, conveniently located, Spark. Okay, Spark is a communication library associated with URHL7. Okay, 
Um, right now, all Spark does is read in and write out files. That's what it does. In the future, we'd like it to be socket. But for now, our needs at URMC is we already have it coming on socket. We probably just need to parse stuff. This was built specifically for a problem that Marco had. And the problem was we got a really big file. We're talking gigabyte. Yeah. You know, not a good file to just open to text editor. Um, how do we read all these messages? Okay. So there's two classes, Spark File Reader, Spark File Writer. All right to each other. And there's a listener. Okay, the HL7 message listener. It's going to be very similar to your Windows listener or your SAX listener kind of thing. Um, it, right now it's very simple. It's going to become more complex when we have to do socket stuff. But very simple version is message received. And the parameter passed in is the HL7 structure. Okay. Uh, what ends up happening is you read the file, and it'll read only a chunk of data at a time. As soon as it gets, so it's a buffered reader. Okay. Uh, as soon as it gets a full message, because it's looking for that new line character, as soon as it gets that, it'll pop it off and throw it to the listener. The listener handles it. It'll keep going. Okay. It doesn't store the, that message in memory anymore. As soon as you're done processing it, it goes. This allows all of us to use that to open as big of a file as you want. The limitation is no longer how big the file is, it's how big the message is. Which is another problem with that we're getting this multi-hundred megabyte messages, which that one we did something different. <laughs> but the idea there was we basically just broke up those messages a little bit. We still used uh, your original seven. We were able to break that up by saying, okay, let's see what these are. Do it one at a time, kind of go in and cheat a little bit, say, okay, we know this is gonna be a, a return here. That kind of thing, but that's how we did that. So Spark uses a listener model. I'm going to demonstrate that in just a second. Hey, what do you know? Demonstrate. Um, so there's two things that you want to do when you do this. Okay, the first thing is you have to actually implement the message listener. Okay, this is the same thing as a Windows adapter kind of thing, whatever. In fact, there is an adapter. If you have a small file that you just you just implement it and you call parse and then you can say get list and give you just a list back. It doesn't work for very large files because it make you cry, but whatever. So, implement message received, get last name, get first name, bring it out, return true. Return true is, gonna, is a hook for later on when we actually have to acknowledge or negative acknowledge socket communication. Okay? But very simple listener, nothing crazy. And then you have how to make this actually work, right? You instantiate your listener, okay? You instantiate your reader, you can set your listener, you can do that at the same time, it doesn't matter. Try, parse, and you're done. Okay, so, uh, these are good examples of how you would do this. You know, in, in your, is this guy over here? For Marco, or anybody doing a big database, you know, get the patient name, get the patient MRN, you know, all the patient information that you care about that you know is just going to be there because almost every HL7 message has it, and you're just loading your patient table. Right there, and then hey, what do you know? You put a DB connection there, so you can have a little bit of a, a efficient way to do this, and just run with it. So Marco does that kind of stuff already with the DB loader classes. But um, so just to prove that I'm not lying to you, um, maybe we just do that really quick. And the file that I hit has four patients in it, charge testing, uh, Steve, Bill, and Joe. So I got those. Well, you might ask, what does that file look like? Well, OK, I can show you that. I could be nice and just show you this file. Or we could talk about, sorry, pretend where you guys care, <coughs> looking glass. Okay, so this is just a toy that we built, right? Um, and the whole idea was, how do you look at HL7 messages? Back over here, go back here, objects. And just stick around. Uh, just to demonstrate what it is, almost all of these Java files are GUI related. There's almost no actual, there's one, the one thing, the, the uh, 
the tree Igor model, the Igor tree model. And basically that will give you the tree structure that the J tree needs. But everything else is just um, it's it's all built on the underlying data structures. So if I put this over here and then I open that same file. Got too many screens. There's four messages in there. Which message do I want to look at? We'll get one. Okay. And there it is. And I can look at it as atomic data points if I want. I can modify stuff if I want. So I can do that. I can move to Is that a live save? Message. It doesn't save. Okay. Um, actually, it does. Okay. I can save. It doesn't live save, but you can save. Uh, and then I can also just go in and just do something. As soon as I added a bunch of these pipes here, and I've got more over here now. So does looking glass use URHO7? Yes. Engine? Yeah. So all this is is draw me a frame, draw me a menu, draw me a, a tree view, look at the structure. The structure is defined by that Igor tree class, that, that one. And all that is, just because you guys actually might find it cute, is basically establishing the relationship here of is a leaf, and then how are all they doing. And really, it's only 126 lines of get me those children, give me those things. So, yeah, it's a lot of these things else, but. Nobody's going to have a heart attack here. We're all adults. But you get your model listener, and you can tie your events. And then there's one. Right. And then. But that was cool. Here's the future work, right? Socket programming, that's the big thing. The problem with socket programming is really the scope of it. Okay? Um, it's not as simple as, say, create a socket and accept it. Most of the time it is, but not every time. And, and that's really the big catch is we need to be able to look at it and say, OK, what are the parameters that we're going to accept as settings that you can set up for the socket and all kinds of stuff and get that all set up. Um, the protocol itself is very simple. It's just a couple of character terms and keys and some other hex bytes, but it's OK. Um, but that one requires more than just a single person <laughs> to work on. Uh, structural enforcement. Okay, I didn't really talk about HL7 rule. but um, the idea behind your HL7 is to just take whatever you get and put it into a structure. It is much more difficult to say, I have a structure, I want to make sure that it fits. Okay. You can go through and you could, there's an HL7 rule, which basically you can specify locations and say, I want these to exist, I want these to not exist, I want them to be uh, non empty, all that kind of stuff. But uh, when you do that, you have you know, 30 lines. There, there's got to be a better way to do that. So that's the next thing is how do we enforce that? And then the other thing is, is if you don't have a message to like start with, you can you can create a message, but you gotta say, okay, create me an MSH segment. Give me twenty fields. On this one, give me a couple components. Okay, create a PID segment. Give me fifteen fields. And so it's again a longer way to go about doing things. The the way to solve that is not too bad, as far as technically. The way to solve that's actually very difficult, as far as Okay, now you gotta look at all the specs. You gotta say, okay, this is what that message is defined as. And you've got to put that somewhere. You've got to store it and say, okay. If you want to create an ADTA01, which is a simple admit message, run this method that will generate you a blank one. Uh, to help with this a little bit, if you have a message already, you can use that and then you can copy it. There's a copy function, and then there's a flag in the copy thing that says don't keep the data inside of it. So you can actually create blank ones very easily. Uh, you just make a lot of templates, though? It would be a lot of templates. Yeah. But when we're talking a lot of templates, we're talking hundreds of hundreds yeah. of templates. And it, especially because it gets a little bit more complicated when you start talking about all the variations you might need. Um, and then the acknowledgments. There may or may not be some jokes in this. 
But uh, <laughs> mostly towards the end. But you know, thanks to Marco and Dr. Krush. Uh, Dr. Krush is not here, but and uh, I said, Marco, I want to build this. And Marco said, Sure. I said, I got to talk to Dr. Krush and make sure I can open source it. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Krush said, Sure. And so everybody was happy, especially me. Uh, and then most of the team that's here. Uh, Phil is not here, but Phil is like my guy. I go to Phil. Phil, what do we need, or how should this work? And Phil goes, How about this? And he gives me the idea. Like, okay. And then I'll uh, thanks to you guys for sticking with me. Even though you guys have absolutely no interest in this. Did <laughs> uh, change ideas three or four times? Twice. Once. I changed it from the original to this one. Uh, thanks to my wife, even though she's not here. <laughs> and then uh, my buddy Joe, who I play hockey with, uh, actually was an editor for a newspaper. So I said, hey, Joe, can you look That's at this for me? And he read over my paper. And <laughs> the comments were hilarious. Uh, when I, when I found, because I kept, I kept screwing up its, and I put an apostrophe in there, because that was my problem. And I did it like 15 times. He's like, oh my god, kill me. And then I did it right, and he professed his belief in the deity. He's like, thank you, <laughs> god, it's amazing you didn't screw up. Talking about all the classes and the definitions. He's like, I'm just going to skip this part because I know you're talking about him. So, but so, but, but. questions? Back up one slide. <laughs> uh -oh. All right. So, and you should have seen this coming from the afternoon. Uh -huh. How often do you change what you need to suck out of uh, an HL7 file in your socket or whatever? I mean, instead of just getting first and last name, we want to get specific. Data, right? Mm -hmm. And as it stands right now, you need somebody with a modicum amount of knowledge to be able to go and write some code. Right. Interface. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Interface, well, inner future work. Oh, interface is going to be a massive this user interface you're talking yes. about. Yes. Okay, so fun story. Yeah. Um, uh, please look towards the back of the room. Everybody that enjoys using the user interface that we have capable, that we're able to use uh, currently, please raise their hands. The, 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 the JCAPs. Oh, is yeah. the opposite of it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the problem, is to build an interface for a lot of this kind of stuff yep. is not even uh, trivial, is so not even, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I'm with hey, you. That's why I didn't just show up. Nice. Oh, he just finished thanking you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that's why I only backed up one slide. To future work, rather than backing up more slides to you got to do it. <coughs> All right, so that's 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 definite. Because remember, future work is infinite time and infinite money. It's for the next person that's coming along, sees this, thinks this right. is a pretty cool idea, and go, how could I build a project or something out of this? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just going to make you write a paragraph. On. Right. What I'm going to do. Right. So yeah. um, the cool thing is everything's a data field. Yeah. So to do a map is actually pretty easy. Um, but to do structural changes, which is usually the problem. Because you can just do a mapping structural changes, which is usually the, the more difficult thing. Do an interface for that. Uh, Oracle tries to do that. And they yeah. Up. Yeah. So that's the problem with that. But even even I, I realize that you know the, the whatever interface you mentioned that everybody in the back wrote their hands down further if possible. <laughs> All that, but at least then somebody without a modicum of knowledge could get something out of it. Yeah. And there's always that because there's always an admin. Interface that is has some you know not an, as administrative but as an, an assistant right. that can right. you know give me all the all the patient names for people who were here in the last month mm -hmm. if I had a bunch of check boxes mm -hmm. that could stream through all the data it would it would be more useful that you wouldn't have to suck up time of a programmer to do that so uh, yes and I'll write the paragraph that's fine right. that's all it's I'll been do. done that specific thing has been done oh, okay so my buddy Phil. That guy, yeah. Uh, he does a lot of reports, all right. and uh, basically he's built a script that all it does is say, okay, specify those locations that you want, yeah. and it will generate for you. Well, and we use that in reports. Yeah. So, so what it is is you specify PID three, PID five, PID whatever. No grab everything for you for now. I'm happy. Yeah. He grids Excel documents and makes charts. It's great. Um, as far as what other things we do. We have a search tool built off of this, so we can just specify this location, this value, confine things, and search through multiple messages. Cool. So we have a lot of those things I can show you them. Right? Awesome. The problem is, is I don't have a test version of them, Not so I can't show you guys them. Yeah. <laughs> when you were talking, this struck me as, uh, <laughs> believe me, as Jack's B meets XPath. Yeah. And I think what Dan's talking about is, is the XPath side of it, that you, know, you need to know something about the 
structured. Right. Well, and that's what the transfer comes down to. Comes down to. Right, so uh, if you're going to talk about other products that are out there, so the only thing that doesn't suck at all is Happy. Happy is uh, another thing I like a little bit. Um, what they do is they take the HL7 message and they translate it to a transitional XML file, and then you use XPath to grab whatever you want. The problem is it still uses underlying structures. They built out all of those structures, and so if you want something else, sure. So you can build customizations, but it's still. Happy. Then what about mappings instead of saying PID 5.1 and 5.2 for first name and last name? Why can't I just say get first name and have a mapping of 5.1 to first name so you don't need to know where it is? So you can do that, right? Uh, again, everybody in the back of the room, and I'm not trying to do that, I'm just saying I, exactly, I completely understand. Um, the big concern is if you make it too stupid, Right? Um, do you really want people that all they know about the HL7 message is that they're going to get the family name, and that's all they know? They don't know where it's in the message or anything like that. Do you want them being the ones that design the code that's going to keep you alive in the hospital? No, that's for a report writer. Right. Yeah. Think, so, think about, don't think about what you. Think right, no, and, and I understand that. Um, pretty much across the board, anyone that has any understanding of HL7 is going to go with. The, the kind of nicknames that we go, yeah, because it's talking about specifically what you're talking about. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there, and we're talking about what we build as far as our OTDs. Those those methods, those Jack's B things. It's get n34 patient name cx dot get family name dot get whatever the heck the next one is. Yeah. You guys, you guys sell nightmares. Can you tell me what <laughs> but like so that. they actually bring those all out, I and they that. don't use hit five. Which is the most frustrating thing because that's what we use. That's what everybody in the in the industry uses. It's what they think well, it's what they're supposed to use. Yeah. It's right. not guaranteed that they will be right. They may even three. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. But there's somebody sitting there using crystal reports type of person right. who just right. wants to gen and not necessarily go digging through it and certainly not changing it. Right. Just wants some superficial demographic information or whatever. Yeah. Right. And this isn't and, and the truth is this isn't your problem. It's probably not your boss's problem. It's your boss's 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 problem who doesn't want to pay X for you when I can pay X divided by two right. for somebody else just to get this as a data. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so what we do is we load that data into a database. Mm -hmm. In our case, Epic. And Epic, we have a whole reporting team that writes crystal against the data yeah. that's already stored in the right thing for snap. Okay. So you, you can do it. Right? Yeah. So the, the, the question isn't whether or not it's possible. The question is whether or not it you want to. Yeah. Um, as far as if we're talking about, let's say, patient or something, and somebody wants to do kind of report on that. Yeah, right. the, the real problem, what Kevin kind of referred, was PID 3. I told you that that's medical record number. Mm -hmm. Not always. That's the external patient ID, officially, yeah. which would be the medical record number. But sometimes they put something in PID 2, and that's what they care about. Or a visit number. I don't know, there's three or four different places you can put a visit number depending on how you define a visit, which I, in the depth of the call, not really in depth, but it's in the paper, right? And so, yeah. like, what the heck is a visit? What's an encounter? What's an appointment? All of those problems manifest themselves in the data a lot because like, what is that? But that's, a, that's an ontology philosophy problem, not a technical thing, but that's, that's kind of the thing. Yeah, we can map given name or that, and yeah, given name's probably going to be okay, but. As a transitional kind of thing, not too many people are doing reports off of them. We yeah. do, but um, it would be possible to map everything again. It's the same problem as building the structure. You still have to find out what are all those mappings in the search tool that we have. Can't show you because <laughs> I don't have a test version. Um, I do do. do you, yeah. uh, I build out um, those mappings. So you build out those mappings, and so if you want to get family name. It actually does the lookup for you. And that's a that's a JavaScript lookup thing that yeah. I just have an array. But I can show you that too. If you want. We can include it if you want. But those are just another tool that are built off of the so, Yeah. So switching gears, you said at one point that throwing exceptions was a bad thing. Yes. Why? So here's the deal. Exceptions aren't necessarily a bad thing in when you have an engine that has a little bit of a problem here and there, and needs to stay in its room, you have other problems. Okay, so we can do a giant try catch around 
everything and prevent stuff, but then we have a very low visibility of what possibly happened. Um, the real problem that we run into is essentially the way we have stuff architected at work, which we are not we want to do anything. If we throw an exception, it's very likely going to crash that service by design, which is a scary thing to <laughs> test by design. But the idea is if you've got a message that something you did not expect, something screwed up, you're going to crash. And you want it to because you don't want to keep allowing that to happen. So as far as what we're doing, we want to be able to test for various things like that. But at the same time, in our old, in our old system, in our old structure, if something wasn't there, so if someone didn't put in a PID 18, let's say, maybe it's a number, if I remember. Hey, Lord, that's weird. Okay, so PID 18 is a number. Um, a couple problems could happen. If the OTD didn't have it map, mapped out in its structure, you get an exception because you couldn't even parse it. Here, so you're screwed there. If you tried to access it and it wasn't there, even though there's pipes there, but it wasn't there, exception, no pointer exception. Okay, so all these exceptions would be very exception inverse, which is you know, a thing. Now, as far as what your HL7 is able to do, you can pass nulls back. There, there's flags that say pass me back a null rather than a null field if you want to deal with nulls. But the idea that we had was how do we make it just work and let, leave it to the, the analyst or the programmer to say, okay, I'm going to test this to make sure that it's got the data I care about or whatever I care about. I've got that square and I'll worry about that part, but don't break on me. Just be resilient. Get me through to that part where I can say, okay, do I have first name, last name, address, and all that kind of stuff. I've got all those. I'm good. I don't really care what the OBX segments are. I don't really care if, I don't really care, let's say, that gender's there, okay? And I get back an empty string. I'm okay with that. I don't want it to give me a null, though, because the null just makes me have a headache. I don't want the headache. So, okay, but so it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's, a, it's a personal slash team philosophy. Well, it's a business that's, decision. Right. And that's, that's not, not handling the exception. Mm -hmm. You've made a business decision that you're going to not pass back a null, you're going to pass back an empty string. Um, you've handled the exception. You can just eat it and, not, and try to continue. That's what it sounded like you were saying when you earlier. I, I, or at least what sorry, I heard. Sorry, you're being fun. Yeah. Um, so, so you are handling it. You're just yeah. choosing to handle it this way. Right. It's not an exception that needs further handling. So it's, you don't need to log a message in. Right. So the idea is basically anything that would normally have Generate an exception usually generates a null field. That's the very short version. If there's something that would have screwed up because you're asking for a segment that's not there or you're asking for something like that, you're going to need a null field. So you can test against null field, you can test it against quote, quote, whatever makes you feel warm and fuzzy. But it suppresses the exceptions. So now you don't have to do try catches to catch all these exceptions for. Maybe you just want to get 17 things. You don't want to write 17 different try catches because you want the visibility of what you got. Earlier, you mentioned something about HL uh, rule. Yes. Can you utilize that for what we're talking about here? Sort of. Okay. So, um, uh, I do actually have questions from the online audience. Um, that we're just going to go because Elvis Montero wants to know why the hell we use HL7 rather than JSON, and the short version is because we do. Um, okay. <laughs> So you go to documentation. Let's go here. All right. Structure. There's a rules test thing. Okay. I'm doing this because it's a little bit easier to zoom in and stuff. Rules test. Okay. Uh, HL7 rule is basically a location and a specific rule. Okay. And that rule right now is pretty short. It's an enumeration of exist. So is there pipes? Exist not empty. Is there something between the pipes? Or is it numeric? Okay, so that one's just a symbol and you try to parse a number if you have your goal. Uh, what you're able to do, if you want to enforce a certain structure, make sure stuff is there, this is the easiest way to do it. Okay, well, I mean, you can do has methods, methods okay, so you can wherever there's a get or set, there's also has. Okay, but if you wanted to set up, I want to make sure PID 5 is there, I want to make sure PID 3 is there, I want to make sure all these are there. Set up a bunch of rules, you can add it to a list, and then you can either do one at a time or just 
that hook returns true through false. So that's how you can really kind of do baseline acceptance of a message. Um, but there's a lot of times where we don't really care about most of the message. We only care about specific things. So that's why it's designed this way. Any other questions? Yeah, thoughts? So Igor lets you um, get the message. It's pronounced Igor. Oh, I won't. <laughs> and it lets you get a message and then chop it up and arrange it differently and then create a, a whole new entity, a whole new creature. It seems to me that that's named pretty properly and it's kind of clever. <laughs> just get yes. that out. And then once, you, um, once you're ready, you can just spark it and it'll be sent out. I mean, uh, right. It's I like you uh, uh, watch too many four minutes then. <laughs> so, no, but the idea, the idea there is, yeah, yeah it, it's just giving you the parsing. That's why all the Igor stuff I go over is all parsing, really, Spark is going to be communication stuff, whatever else you go. Come up with clever names, because that's what you should do. Rather than make it make sense, make clever names, which I'm really good at. <laughs> right? How many things do I need to work at? It's not even funny anymore. Um, I know the question. Yeah. Any questions from the no, Where's the softballs? Are you putting on your online? Uh, so that was Montero asked, um, you know, wouldn't it be easier with JSON? Yes. Well, <laughs> no, no, because the it problem is, is to, the, 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 well, to do it would be crazy. And yeah, JSON would be great with smaller data, but there's so much data there, it wouldn't be more readable, that's for sure. No. And then, yes, you could AJAX it to something, but why? It's still, it's still <laughs> not, yeah, it's still not about readability, right. it's about standard. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing the thing that Nate, there's nothing to do with your presentation, the thing that drives me nuts is you say, like, well, okay, but it's sometimes it's PID 2 and PID 3. Mm -hmm. What the hell? So, funny story. Yeah. Talk it's, about it in the paper, but I'll just mention it now. It's, it's, when they came up with HL7, yeah. the spec, they intentionally made it just big enough that it was easy to implement. And so the mentality that they had was get it so, like, 80% of the stuff works most of the time yeah. and just fidget with it later. And that continues the trend of healthcare, which is get it work as much as possible and then throw people at the problem and they'll figure it out. Who's the governor body of that? HL7 is, <laughs> is created by HL7. Uh, Health Level 7 is an organization that um, if you pay money, you can be friends with or something. And they come up with these standards uh, every year or so. They come up with a view. And if they, this is what we believe. You know, I was saying that it was originally created by Duke as one of the founding members of the organization. It was a volunteer organization, and they said, now you have to pay to be a member to balance. Mm -hmm. Was it built in 1972, was it? No. Late 80s. Late 80s. Might as well have been 1970. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I mean, our EMR, yeah. the language that's written in. Oh, yeah. Before the moon landing. Oh, yeah, it's your part of it. He's going to use it as good as what the industry uses. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, the thing is, is I've been in meetings where they're like, oh, do you want to use version 3? And you don't understand what the heck's going on here. No. This is what we use. Version 2 is what's going on. Version 3 isn't necessarily better. It's just different. And really. XML yeah. doesn't help no problem. XML is. Oh, it's verbose. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any other thoughts or concerns or questions? Lots of concerns, but I think I'm going to voice to you right now. <laughs> I'll let you, as, as I kick you out of the room and we'll start talking about you when I get back, I'll leave you with that thought. Oh. I, that's what I expect. You're not too worried about it, Dan. <laughs> All right, good. You should be. Okay. So thank you. All right.